All right, everybody, thank you for coming tonight. This is Mike Lagerquist from Vine Faith in Action. We are here with the guys from Mankato Computer Technology, as you can see from the screen. And we are talking tonight about Google and other search engines. So it's a, it's a key component to your finding out what you're looking for online. So I will hand this over to Trevor and then Colin will be working behind the scenes. You won't see his face, but he'll be there working all the dials and, and the switches. All right. Awesome. Daniel. Thank you, Mike. Um, well, welcome everyone to um, our Mankato Computer Technology University. Uh, my name's Trevor. I actually don't work for Mankato Computer Technology, but um, I work for Master Electric here in town. And uh, Colin and Wes and I got together and came up with this idea a few years back now, and it's been going really well. Um, just to try to keep you guys informed of the latest and greatest technology, things to keep you safe online and things to make your experience a little bit more enjoyable. And uh, it's really progressed and developed over the years. And we are all the way to the point now that we actually start each class with showing you how you can access this information. Um, I know Mike will do something with it for Vine because he records it. Um, but we also put the PowerPoint presentation up online for uh, Mankato Computer Technology. And Colin will show you how to access it in case you want to have the slideshow on your own um, or print it out at home or follow along on your own as you go. We also included some hyperlinks in today's presentation. So you might want to revisit the presentation so that you can look at those links at a later time. But with that, I'll give Colin the floor here for a few minutes just to walk you through the website and see, so you can see how to access the presentations. So all of the presentations that we've done with Vine uh, are, are uploaded onto the website, which is mankitotext.com. So if you go to mankitotext.com um, and uh, from the homepage here, uh, if you go to the about uh, button here, it, you'll, you'll get this little tab and you can click on the presentations. Um, and from there, that'll take you to a, a handy dandy list of all the different uh, presentations we've done. Um, today's of course is right at the top. Uh, and if you click on that, it'll open up in your uh, browser as long as you have, um, yeah, it should, no matter what browser you're using, it should open up in there. From here, uh, you can print it if you're uh, feeling old school. Uh, you can uh, you can download it and uh, save it on your computer for offline use later. Uh, I'd note this one is 67 pages. So, um, you know, maybe downloading is better than printing in that case. So, um, but again, mankitotext.com, uh, from the home page, go to the about button, click on presentations, and then from there you can go to today's presentations or any others. And while I've got a captive audience here, quick, just a, a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, I usually don't do things like this, but we, uh, uh, Mankato Computer Technology is hiring. Um, so if you know anybody uh, who's a capable tech and is for, first and foremost, foremost good at communicating, those are uh, sometimes mutually exclusive. Um, definitely send them our way. We're doing a, a referral bonus right now. So if you want to uh, send me an email um, or send a, uh, an email to info at mankitotext.com uh, and then tell the person that we have a careers page um, where they can go to apply for, for the job. If you uh, if if we hire them, you'll get six hundred dollars um, upon hire, and then six hundred dollars after they've been with us for six months. So, commercial over. Well done, Colin. Well done. Sounds like you could go to a BNI meeting and present that. <laughs> <laughs> I very well could. <laughs> I might see you at one on a Thursday, then perhaps. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> um. So I. Riding on Colin's coattails on that, like I love working with the guys down at Mankato Computer Technology, and they have been helpful on every computer I've built or had since I came to town. And my favorite thing about them is that even earlier this week, I asked Colin for help. My boss's wife was looking for a computer, just a laptop or something small that she get on the internet with. And I emailed Colin and said, hey, this is kind of what I'm looking for. And this is, and he said, he was very honest and said, well, what do you want to do with it? And we explained. And then he said, you know, then I honestly think this is your best bet. And it wasn't necessarily a product that they sell or move there at Mankato Computer Technology, but he did offer me the best 
uh, solution for what I needed. And they've done that every time I've gone in there with a question. So um, on, honestly, I love giving them my business and it's just a cool place to go hang out and talk to. They help you solve all kinds of problems. And so I'm really happy to be a part of their team and uh, looking forward to doing these for as long as we can. So um, with that, today's a really interesting topic and I have enjoyed it immensely. Um, one of my favorite things about it is how much of it I've discovered because of Colin. So I'm glad to have him here as a subject matter expert today. Um, some of it I have verified, or like I said, I've, I've, I've listed the information because of what I've had conversations with Colin about. Um, other stuff I reached out to, and it's really hard to verify. You'll kind of see what I mean later when I talk about like this website says when you visit it, they plant a tree for you or that they're um, that they run on 100% recycled energy or, you know, I don't know how honest all of those are. I wasn't able to fact check all of that stuff, but if it's something that makes you feel good when you uh, search the internet, then I think it'd be worthwhile. Um, as Colin mentioned, this presentation is 67 slides and there's a lot of text, so I'm not going to read it all to you. But when it comes to these technical presentations that we have to give you a lot of information that you are going to... Um, probably need to revisit at another time. I like to just put as much information on the slide as possible so that when you go back and read it, you don't have to look at it and go, oh, what did Trevor say about this? You, I'll give you the clip notes version when we're talking now. And then if you want to go and revisit the presentation, like I said, all the information and the links are built into it. So um, you can download it and click on those presentations anytime you would like. So um, with that, I'm gonna, we'll start off. I'm gonna give you several other search engines besides Google. And honestly, this list was created because I Googled what are the 17 other great search engines that you can use. So um, I'm a pretty loyal Google user. Um, I'm not too concerned about how they use my data. I don't get really paranoid about it. It does kind of creep me out when I get ad suggestions on my phone that are for things that I talked about or sometimes even just looked at or somebody else talked about. Um, that kind of makes me nervous because I feel like Google's always listening and I do have a Siri in my house so I, or uh, Alexa in my house and so I know she's related to Google. So um, it does kind of spook me out and, um, but I just kind of take it as a consequence of technology that if they're gonna listen to me and try to push ads at me, but I also feel like I have a good understanding of that. And um, I know that sometimes social media or ads that are pushed to you is to, you know, make you want to buy stuff or to um, elicit a response. And so if you go into it with that attitude, you can be a little bit more protected about like, just because they send me an ad for it doesn't mean I need to buy it. Um, it was a budgeting uh, conversation I had long before the internet was somebody told me like, get rid of magazine subscriptions or get rid of catalog subscriptions, because when you get those, all you want to do is spend money. So um, if you can ignore the ads and ignore some of the stuff that gets pushed to your phone because of Google, um, I still think it's a great search engine, but here's a list of some of the other ones that are out there. The number one other search engine I think that's out there right now is Bing. Um, Colin, can you verify, does Bing come default on any search engines or devices? I think it's on the Microsoft ones, right? Yeah, so if um, if you have a computer that's running Windows 10, which should be any Windows computer you're using at this point, because the older versions of Windows are out of support, um, then it, it will come uh, automatically loaded with uh, Microsoft Edge. And when you first uh, fire up Microsoft Edge, the, uh, the default search engine will be Bing because Microsoft loves to, uh, to keep things cohesive, as they would say. Uh, yeah really that they want to keep you using their products so. right so if a, a big understanding of the computer world is the three biggies in the in the industry right now are going to be your google your microsoft and your apple and a few years ago none of those companies really played well together now they're a little bit more interactive but like colin said they try to keep all of their stuff in-house so Microsoft released Windows 10, then they came out with their own new browser, and then built into that browser, they built in a new search engine. Now you can use other search engines from Microsoft's browser or from Google's browser or the Apple browser if you wanna use. You can use Google search engines across any of those or you can use any of these other search engines. But um, I know it was a big deal when uh, 
it's just Microsoft Explorer now, Colin, the Microsoft one. It used to be Internet Explorer, but now is it just Explorer or Edge? Edge? Edge, yep. Edge, okay. So Edge had some built-in features to try to block out ads and stuff, and then Bing was incorporated into that. And so it is a strong search engine. It yields really good results. Um, they do have a rewards program. Now, to me, some of these rewards programs remind me a lot of like slot machines or casinos. Like they give you just enough to keep making you want to use them over and over. Like if you get a thousand points, so if you do a thousand searches, we'll send you a penny or we'll give you in its, the, the rewards aren't necessarily, um, an incredible incentive other than they give you like that addictive mental, like I need to use that search engine because they give me rewards points and I need everybody else that's using my computer to use that search engine. So I get more rewards points, but um, there are good things and, and healthy causes you can donate those reward points to and do stuff with. So um, if you're going to get rewards, you might as well use a program that maybe donates to your school or to a, a, an event or a charity that you like. Um, there's other ways to do that too. So um that's one way the user interface is really good to, I think compared to Google's, it's a little bit easier to use. Um, and it has a really good experience for video. And uh, since Google owns YouTube now, if you Google something and you look for videos, you're most likely going to get a YouTube video because Google owns YouTube. So they're gonna push you to their product where Bing is not related to YouTube because it's a Microsoft product it'll give you other video uh, sources, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. So it could give you a Vimeo or um, one of the other free video um, production, reproduction companies out there that you can get to um, without just going to YouTube or staying within that Google product line. So Colin, anything you'd like to add about Bing? I know your favorite one that you always recommend to me is coming up next, but Bing is one that we don't talk about a lot. No, I think that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good synopsis. Okay. We can go to the next one. So DuckDuckGo, <clears throat> I'll be totally honest. Colin talks about this one to me all the time and I don't use it. I, um, I've never used it actually, but I have high recommendations and I've heard really good things, especially about the data tracking. I try to convince myself that if I do, if I add some of the features where I open a private browser or uh, hide my search history, those kind of things that I'm hiding my information from the internet, but I don't think it really works, but um, makes me feel better when I click on it. But DuckDuckGo, from what I've heard, is a really good browser that doesn't really track your history. It doesn't collect or store any of your personal information. Um, so that means every time you do a search or use the search engine, you're kind of starting over from scratch, which if you're into the security thing, I think this is the way to go. If you like it that Google doesn't autocorrect and gives you your favorite restaurant as soon as you type, start typing in the name, then I would say this isn't the route to go. Um, but you can worry about uh, other people not watching you or looking at your searches or trying to figure out what you're looking at. Um, with some of the stuff I Google, I'm like, I got to be on watch lists. Ever since I was in graduate school and I was studying the Patriot Act and the Second Amendment, I was like, I'm on somebody's watch list for sure. I know it. But um, if I would had DuckDuckGo back then, maybe I wouldn't be. So um, I don't know if it'll, just, it probably won't protect you from uh, from <laughs> the government finding out what you're searching. But um, one one interesting part about this uh, is if you're if you're looking, you know, we we hear a lot about information bubbles and people who are getting uh, are caught in like Internet echo chambers um, as you use a search engine like Google it notices what news sources you go to most often, what types of websites you go to, and it serves you what it expects you to want um, based on its algorithms. So one interesting thing I like to do with DuckDuckGo is if I'm researching something and I, I, I want to you know, see if I can eliminate my normal technological bias or want to find other sources that I wouldn't necessarily have, have stumbled across, DuckDuckGo is a good way to do that. And if you want to run an experiment about what Colin's talking about, uh, the owner of Mankato Computer Technology gave me a great story about him and his wife one night. They were Googling the same term, but they both got vastly different results where Wes is a retail store owner and his wife is a nurse. And so like she got like more medical explanations of the thing they were looking for. And he got more commercial related things that they were looking for. So 
if you want to run an experiment and see which search engine like tends to lean towards your biases, have you and another person that you know that maybe don't have the same viewpoint or the same background, both pick a term and search it and then see what comes up. And so I think the term they use, which I don't know if somebody be telling this story now, but they searched urinal and they got totally different results. And it's like, that's the same object. And I have an image in my head of what that is, but when his wife was trying to explain it to him, so it's not only like a male and female difference of like, no, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm talking about. And they both Googled it and like, see, I'm right. But um, it was just an, an interesting experiment and something worth doing where like Colin says, this search engine is going to give you a blank slate every time. And probably if you both use DuckDuckGo, this would be the experiment um, to see if you get the same results when you use DuckDuckGo from a clean slate and no search history or bias based on what you like to do. So those information loops, that's a, I didn't know that was the terminology column, but I was trying to explain that earlier about the search engine start to give you stuff that you already know about or that you already like, and that can be dangerous if you're not aware of it. So we can move to the next one. Um, <clears throat> this one is, I think, really popular amongst uh, kids, and I think it was kind of the first one that people use to uh, start contributing information, but its ability... I think it's a lot better now for verification of facts, but um, there was a time there where there was a lot of just plagiarized information on here, or there was a time when people kind of manipulated this system to put up the information that they thought was accurate, although it may not have been factual to a point. So um, wiki.com, I think it comes from, it used to be Wikipedia, and this pulls results from lots of wikis, which maybe Colin will explain what a wiki is. Um, it's the perfect search engine for those people who appreciate community-led information as it's found on sites like Wikipedia. So, Colin, do you know what a wiki is? I didn't really look what that yeah, was. A, a wiki is essentially a reference book that's constantly open for editing from its members. And uh, the members of the community are uh, also constantly rated on their trustworthiness, um, the quality of their edits. Uh, and their, the length of their history working within the wiki. Um, so theoretically, it's a social experiment. As time goes on, um, the, the information gets better and better. Um, you know, the biggest one is Wikipedia, which is a giant encyclopedia um, that, you know, when, when a celebrity uh, dies at 3 p.m. And, on, on a Tuesday, uh, by 3.02, there's an entry in there. And that's because there are thousands of people, maybe millions of people around the world who take it upon themselves. And a lot of them are researchers and archivists in, in professionally as well. Um, but some of them are just uh, data enthusiasts, I suppose you would say. Um, so it's, uh, it's a, really, a really interesting way to do uh, reference material. Um, it's also something that you want to keep in mind can be changed and edited at any given time. So, so if you uh, found something on there yesterday, it might not be the exact same as it is yep. if you look at it today or tomorrow. But, the, but there is also, if you really want to dig into the bones, there are usually ways. Uh, these are, are usually quite transparent in their version history. So if you want to go in and see what kind of edits were made and by whom, you can do that. Okay. So, um, and I don't know what their data tracking is like, but it, it's, a, it's an alternative to a search engine in a way because it, it lets resources community-led information, which I think is cool. Um, these two are also not traditional um, search engines per se, but if you're looking for up-to-the-date current information, these are good sites that you can use. Um, there's lots of information to be found. So as Colin said, um, with wikis and like the information being spread at, if somebody died at three o'clock on a Tuesday, the, on wiki it'd be at 302 on Twitter, it would probably be at 301 with a hashtag. Um, so Twitter is a social media platform and it has a limited number of characters that you can post, um, really popular amongst celebrities and athletes, uh, to share information. Um, if you use it correctly and you have topics and people that you like to follow, uh, it can be really helpful to find information you want. It's also really easy to get lost. And um, I find that there's been a lot of 
I think they call them bots or just people that are using it to farm followers or their fake followers. Um, but it is a way that a lot of information is put out into the world and it could be used for good, but mostly I find it's uh, the social rantings of people like actors and athletes. Um, that's really easy to find on there. Occasionally you can find some good helpful information on there, but if you wanted to keep up with it, um, the algorithms they use to search topics and information are really strong. Google's going to catch up eventually, but um, if you're looking for minute by minute updates of an event or something that's happening, it's probably going to be on Twitter. I follow a lot of uh, Microsoft resources on Twitter because when we have an outage for something like uh, Office 365 or the Microsoft Exchange servers, which do email, um, our phone is about to ring off the hook. Um, and so if I can, I usually Microsoft will push out updates uh, about outages and different server problems out uh, on Twitter before other places. You know, I think I've had problems before and asked Colin about them and he's referenced Twitter in uh, a Microsoft post of Microsoft tweeted this this morning and this is probably why that problem is happening. So um, when I did, I did event production for a while and Twitter was really good for races as far as sharing information for if the weather was gonna be bad at a marathon or a triathlon or a section of the course was closed or there was a course change, um, we would push out information to the minute on rain delays, et cetera. So that was kind of a cool way to keep track of it too with Twitter. So that was something I liked. Um, I liked SlideShare. That's the next one for a long time for, um, for me, it was kind of my Pinterest and I used it to help honestly to develop presentations. And I mean, it is what it says. It's like a, it's a, it's a website that shares basically PowerPoint presentations on how to do stuff. Um, and one of the things I used it a lot of was like how to make good PowerPoint presentations. So, um, it's a, it's a neat source. It takes a little while to get into, but if you had, a specific club or something that you were using, it's a good chance that there's slides in there on how to do it. So like I said, the, the biggest avenue I use SlideShare for was I'm in a networking group. And in that group, you have to prepare presentations, everything from 30 seconds to one minute to six minutes. And there's literally slides there on how to make a good six minute presentation, how to make an effective 30 second commercial. And so what to include and how to do it. So um, I haven't used it for much beyond that networking group, but I've shared it with everyone I know that I meet with that's in that group of like, hey, if you really want to tune up your commercials and you're looking for ways to do it, or if you'd like to really make your presentations better, there are literally presentations on how to make a good presentation. So um, I don't know what kind of other content there is that, I, that that's on there because I haven't really dug into it. Um, but there's manuals on there. Um, anything that you would look for that you would see a PowerPoint presentation of, you can probably find it on SlideShare. So it's a little all different, not necessarily a search engine per se, but a good way to find information if you're trying to stay away from the Google machine. Colin, do you have any experience with SlideShare? Have you used it? Uh, I do not. No, it's not okay. what I've used. Okay. So this is one that I probably can never say the name of correctly, but uh, this is another one I think Colin led me to. And I almost am mad at you for it because it probably takes about a half an hour of my day every day um, just to get through my daily updates of the articles I want to read and who I want to read information from. But it's, I consider it my reading because I'm not a big book person. And so I do spend my time reading these through my emails and my homepage. Um, and I do get a lot of good information and a lot of entertaining stories from it. So um, I would say Quora, Colin? Yep, Quora. Okay. I and uh, so it's similar to Wikipedia, but I think it's guided a little bit more either by the users or somebody that's looking to produce content. So they'll throw out questions like, what's the strangest experience you've ever had on an airplane? What is um, a good college to go to for computer networking? Where should I look if I want to get a job in electronics? Where's a good place? What's the most dangerous job in America? What's caliber of gun should I use if I'm carrying a gun in Alaska and I'm going bear hunting? So um, how do I change the oil on a 67 Mustang or 69 Mustang? So there's all kinds of topics on there. And if you spend some time shaping your profile, um, you can either, I like the part that you can either sit back as a casual observer and just read what everybody else wrote. 
Um, or you can dive in and if you are a subject matter expert, you can contribute and either answer the questions or you can um, upvote other people's answers to explain like, yep, I think that's a good answer and this is why. And uh, you can start to tell, like Colin said, um, like based on how many upvotes the person got, it's kind of like their ranking of if people like respect that person's opinion on the internet to say, yep, this is a trustworthy source. I would believe what this person said, or this sounds like a 12 year old who shouldn't be on our, uh, our, our forum anyway. So Colin, do you have anything else to add? You got me started on this one. Yeah, I guess, I, I mean, the, the, I would describe it as a database of questions that are the sorts of things that pop into your head while you're in the shower. <laughs> um, and it's just, uh, like I stumbled across it because I was, um, you know, doing some deep research on like uh, for some historical fiction I was writing. Um, and I can't remember what the first question it was, but a, a, a good example is like, I typed into Google one day, uh, was fetal alcohol syndrome a problem in the middle ages, right? Because people were constantly drinking because the water wasn't clean. Um, so they were drinking beer and wine all day. Um, and I realized I wasn't the first person to ask this question. Somebody had asked it on Quora and you go on Quora, you see the question, uh, that initiated the thread, and then you see the, uh, bona fides of the people who are responding. So they'll list why they're qualified to answer this question. And sometimes they're Ivy league professors, sometimes they're auto mechanics. If the, you know, sometimes they're combat veterans, sometimes they're, uh, you know, they'll list whatever pertinent, uh, uh, quality qualifications they have um and then uh people can vote them up and down and it's a, another really good argument for crowdsourcing um as as a way of doing quality control online i've, I've been really impressed if you like to read stuff on the internet i will warn you that it is a rabbit hole like what you can click on i, I get a newsletter every day that says here's the top 10 core articles we think you would like to read today. And of those, there's usually a one or two that I'd actually like to dive into. But what happens is I click on that one article that I want to read and then I keep scrolling and it's like, oh, that's interesting. It gives me like 10, 15 other articles that aren't in the newsletter that I just got. But it's like, oh, that one's interesting. And then I scroll through that one and click on that one. And I'm sure it's using an algorithm to figure out like, hey, we noticed that you like to read stories about this. So we'll send you more stories about this or that. So Sometimes I wish I could just hit a reset button and go, why do I keep getting all the articles about this? But um, I'd like to reset it like I could my search history every now and then. But um, for the most part, like I said, it kills about a half an hour of my time every morning that it's a junk email that I don't delete. And I, I can't wait till I have some slow time to be like, ooh, I can go through and finally read all my core articles. So something I really enjoy during the day. Um, the next one I mentioned uh, when we were talking about Bing and uh, Vimeo. So YouTube, I wouldn't necessarily call a search engine because it's incorporated into the Google machine. But Vimeo is um, an independent video source similar to YouTube. So um, you can find a lot of music that you may not find or may have copyright issues. They might have put it on Vimeo and not on YouTube. Um, so... Um, there's an alternative and it's Vimeo to YouTube. It's uh, a lot of people that want to share their videos, put their information on there. It has a lot of HD and there's not a lot of ads. I don't know if there's any, I don't even know if you have to have a subscription to not have ads. Um, it's taken me a little while to get used to because again, I get, I get kind of in that loop of, okay, it's Google, it's YouTube, everything I want kind of, it feeds on each other, it threads on each other. And every now and then I just get stuck in this pattern. But I've dove into Vimeo a couple times and I've enjoyed the experience. I, I, I don't mind putting it on shuffle or loading it up and playing it on the TV at home. So there's music and videos in the background. Um, I've had a lot of luck. I can't say that I've used it for much more than music videos. I'm still kind of a certified YouTube technician when it comes to if I need to figure out how to fix my pivot rod under my sink or um, wire a ballast in a light bulb or something. I still like to dive into YouTube or how to light my pilot light. I, I still dive into YouTube with that stuff, but I would assume that you can do that kind of thing on Vimeo as well. But I use it more for if I'm looking for music or music videos, it seems to be a really good source for me. 
Now, some of these, these are the ones that I found interesting, but have not verified. So Colin, I sent this to you early to ask, like, are there any of these I should not include in case any of them are dangerous? But I thought they were interesting and I'm gonna just put out like a disclaimer of like, use these at your own risk because I haven't tried them out. But if you're interested and wanted to know what was out there, these are a couple that are out there. So um, Yandex is a search engine that takes place outside of the United States. And um, I don't know, there was so much stuff during the last presidency that had to do with Russia and interfering and all that stuff. So this is a Russian and Ukrainian website that more than 45% of the users are from those areas. So if you're interested in seeing what kind of search results those people get, um, this would be one you could use. Now, Colin, I don't want to dive too, in, too far into it because it's probably a, a rabbit hole, but I would assume... I mean, Google uses your GPS to help you provide you results based on where you're at. Um, and you would use something like a, a VPN or something if you wanted to say like, I want Google results of if I was in the UK or I want Google results if I was in Australia, you could use like a VPN to kind of trick it into your address location. But this would be a search engine that uses the similar feature without like a VPN. Is that? Yeah, uh, I mean, Yandex will pick up that you're, you're doing that your interface is is US English and it'll try to serve you results uh, that are in English. Um, but, I'll, you know, you'll probably still get uh, a fair number of, of Russian websites or, or uh, Ukrainian websites. I've used it a little bit just to to sort of like tinker around because I noticed uh, that we would occasionally uh, I manage our website for for the company and that we would occasionally get traffic from uh, that was a referral from Yandex, um, which I, I was assuming was just people who are in uh, Eastern Bloc countries uh, searching for technology um, and, and ending up uh, on one in, in Southern Minnesota. Um, but uh, yeah, it's more of a curiosity. I wouldn't, I'm not sure I would, I would switch. Set your homepage uh, to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I just wanted to put some interesting stuff on here to kind of try at your own risk too. This is another one. Um, I'm trying to remember. There was two features, uh, like an RSS feed that they used to have on internet browsers. And there was another app that would put like all of your social media together in one spot. And I can't remember what it was, but I haven't seen it for four or five years. But um, this board reader is um, a a website that you could use if you were looking for specific uh, forums or message board content. So while you might be able to use Google or Bing to end up in one of these places, if you know that you're specifically looking for a message board forum or information in a message board forum, like something like Quora, um, this might be the best way to search for it. If you're looking for maybe multiple sources versus like maybe just Quora, like, oh, what are other message boards that may have had conversation about this? So I know when you get into looking for specifics like ammunition reloading or arrow building or, you know, trebuchet building, like there's all kinds of different websites that you could end up being on from uh, manufacturers down to just a group of guys that want to talk about stuff. So um, if you're interested in trying to find those kind of message boards, Message boards are tough because like Colin said, they're not necessarily verified. You don't know who's just talking on there. And sometimes they just drag on and they rant for so long and it's so frustrating. So if you wanted to use something like this to kind of clean up and narrow down your search results, this might be one. I haven't used this search engine either. Colin, do you have any experience with it? Uh, I think I may have used it a few years ago. I mean, the, the, the whole message board, um, phenomenon is very uh like sort of early internet like late 90s um yeah. and i think websites like uh reddit uh have sort of have sort of been the death knell for a lot of these communities because they have you know giants uh it, it was effectively the largest message board standing and it sucked all the air out of a lot of the other ones um but it's it's interesting to see because 
pretty much every, you know, if you want to find one for Civil War reenactors, if you want to find one for uh, Peugeot mechanics, you know, there's there's usually a message board out there for just about anything, guinea pig owners. Um, and all of them have different sort of uh, moderation rules and uh, cultures within them. Um, so using a tool like this to sort of surf between them is is good. But if you're just dipping your toe um, and you don't mind uh, the the language of uh, uh, of young and enthusiastic internet people, I would recommend Reddit. Oh, Colin, that's such a polite way to say it. Um, I, I guess one of the boards, like a topic of boards, I would think of if you're looking for something specific is if you're working on a product that is no longer listed or manufactured. So it made me think of that when Colin said Peugeot, because I was like, man, I haven't seen a Peugeot in a long time. But um, say you had like an old model Browning rifle or a gun or a car that they don't make anymore. Sometimes message boards are a good place to find information on that because the manufacturer is not going to list that, or maybe the manufacturer is not even in existence anymore, but you could find a group of people who are all interested in that topic and perhaps they have a message board together. So that would be one way to use it. Um, start page. This is another one that um, I haven't personally used, but it comes up as it gives you answers from Google, but doesn't track your data. So at some point, if you are paranoid or don't like the information loop that Google seems to keep putting you in, um, this is one. And um, it seems like it's doing a good job of giving you websites and help deliver information that doesn't track cookies. I, I don't know, you used to have to spend a lot of time deleting cookies from your system and you would do disk cleanup and delete all your temporary internet files. And I know Colin has showed me some tools to continue to do that. And every now and then I run a scan on my computer and it's like, we need to delete 697 cookies from your computer. And I'm like, yep, okay, delete. So I don't know exactly how the tracking cookies get on there. It seems like it's magic, but um, this one says it doesn't put cookies on your computer. I don't know how to verify that as far, because I probably don't have a system that I could just dedicate to like, I'm only gonna use this for a search engine and page. Colin, any experience with this one? That one? The uh, one? No, I, I'm okay. aware of it. I, I have not used it. <laughs> okay. It seems legit. Yeah. Um, AskJeeves.com is what this used to be. And now it's just Ask.com. So the joke is like when it was Ask Jeeves, he was a butler. Now he looks like a bank manager. So that's just kind of the joke about it. Um, not a great search engine for results. But it does lead to good Q&A results that are found um, if you were asking if you did if for people that did use this website and entered the data, it logged it, filed it, and then now you can still access it. So um, and it gives you different answers instead of the ad space. It, it has a little different interface on it. I'd say it's legit. It still exists, um, but it's probably going the way of older search engines. I don't know how long it'll stay around. I don't know how it's uh, monetized or anything. <clears throat> this one looked interesting. And I thought of Colin with this one because we've talked about some of the content that's uh, copyrighted. But this seems to be <clears throat> a good way to access copyright free content. Um, the biggest thing I can think of for this one is I have a friend who owns a, um, it's a photovoltaic company. They produce solar panels that they put on manufactured homes. And he has to do all these videos all the time for his productions and he'll send them to me to preview. And I'm like, that is the weirdest music I've ever heard in a video. Or like, that is so cheesy. Why is that so bad? And he's like, well, you can't put, you know, if you're putting a publication out, that's going to see millions of people, like you can't put copyrighted music on there. So you have to pick these beats or like, I don't know, melodic something that you put on as a background that's not copyrighted that nobody cares if you share. So if you've ever watched like drone footage from somebody like on a YouTube video and it's got this weird beat electronic thump, thump, thump kind of sound and it's just from a low production quality, it's probably not copyrighted music. It probably comes from searching for from a site like this. Um, so if you're looking for music for a video, an image, images are another thing that there's a lot of images that are copyrighted and then some that are open. And if you pay attention enough to the advertising world or especially like low budget advertising stuff, you start to see like, that's the same clip art image I saw for this company in that location. And they're using the same clip art. And 
Man, I can tell you, working for a company like Master Electric, there is a Master Electric in every town in America, I think. So, and we're not all related, but you start looking at like images of electric that you would put on a car for an electric company, and everybody's got the same lightning bolt with the same electric cord or whatever it is. So they're getting non-copyrighted content and finding the most affordable way to do it. So um, if you want to find a way to do stuff without ang making an artist angry, or if you're going to put information out on a large public scale, um, this would be a good way to look for it, whether it's music or art, things that aren't copyrighted, this is a way to find it. So I don't know, Colin, I thought of you with this one because of the writing and the information of, I guess this would be a way that if you're looking for, I don't know, I don't know how much written material would be non-copyrighted or what you would do with non-copyrighted. Yeah, material, well, the, the CC is actually short for Creative Commons, which is a, okay. uh, a sort of like movement that emerged out of the internet um, culture uh, because people you know, it was, it was from people who basically felt that information should be free. And so it's a lot of people who, you know, just specifically want to create data that can be uh, shared and adapted um, and incorporated into other creative endeavors, um, which is, you know, a, a cool kind of utopian idea. Um, open source, you, right? That's the kind yep, of terminology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's what we use for for software. That's that's okay. Uh, done like that, but um, the uh, the you you do have to do some digging. Um, but if you uh, if you are gonna like Trevor said, uh, do something that's gonna be shown to the general public, and you need some video or some music, um, you can uh, you can definitely use this, and it's. There's, there's a lot there. So yeah, we're, if you just did a Google search, you could get yourself into trouble by taking an image that's protected and using it and then having that person come after you for some uh, copyright laws or whatever. Um, so this is one that advertised itself as a secure search engine. So um, it uses sockets layering. I don't even know what these are. AES 256 encryption um, so that it will pull results from a network of search partners, deliver you the information and not send your information to anyone. I don't know how to verify any of this, but for anybody that is concerned again about that information loop or trying to get out of Google, um, again, I would default to Colin to say, have you used it? Do you know anything about it? But um, when you start saying like, I'm scared that Google's tracking my search results. These are the kind of search engines that come up in your Google search. <laughs> yeah, I've not used this, but in principle, uh, it it should work to keep your search results secret from just about anybody that, you know, uh, unless, unless you had it been specifically targeted by malware, um, this will, this will keep corporate and government noses out of your business. I don't know why any good hearted person would ever need to do that, but in the, the, this is the way to do it. So we won't spend a lot of time there. Uh, one search is another one. So Verizon, depending on how you feel about Verizon, again, this is a big media conglomerate who's doing TV and media excuse me, and phones and everything else. So they're looking to put out their own search engine. I'm sure it'll guide you to Verizon funded content. Um, it says they have no cookie tracking, retargeting or personal profiling. They say no sharing of personal data, no storing of user search history, unbiased, unfiltered search results, encrypted search terms. So um, again, I, if you're worried about it, these are worth trying. If I don't know how to verify that they're not, that they're doing what they say they're doing, but if you're nervous about it, you know, I, I don't know, I kind of give into the concept of like, if you put it on the internet, it's out there for somebody or something to do. I met a software designer who uh, manages one of the big data warehouses. And it was, I think it was right when Snapchat came out and he was talking about the idea that yeah, everybody thinks that you take this picture and it just disappears. He's like, in reality, like it's stored in this giant warehouse where they have all these hard drives and servers and that image is, is somewhere on the internet forever. Um, it's just if you want to access it or not. So I kind of feel like 
you know, once you put it on the internet, it's permanent. It's out there. Like somebody's going to have copied it, filed it, reported it, put it somewhere. But these are the kind of websites that say they're not at least not going to track your data. So I don't know, like the most interesting or unique example I can think of that happened to me recently was uh, we sold our house in Arizona in 2008. And I went to look not only did my electricians point me in this uh, idea of looking at Beacon because we were trying to map out how to reroute these power poles to somebody's house. But we looked at the map on Beacon, which was a really interesting website to use. But looking at a house that we sold in 2008, like the pictures from when we listed the house are still up on the internet. So it's like, oh, there's our old cars and there's our old TV and there's our old stereo, you know, all the things that we had in the house. And it was like, oh, that's kind of creepy. Like that contents of our house are still on the internet so i mean that's not a really secure scary thing but if anybody wants an old 2008 flat screen tv we still have it in our living room <laughs> so um i don't call anything about one search have you heard about it uh i've heard of it i i haven't used it i you know if i if i'm thinking about who i you know trust to keep my data secret verizon is not on the short list <laughs> necessarily but um, they're, they're, they're doing this because there is a market for it. And, right. you know, Apple, uh, is very much focused also on, on the idea that they're going to put privacy over profits, uh, because a lot of people are starting to get nervous about how much of our digital lives are exposed, um, to the, to the world in general. Um, so, yeah, but yeah, I can't speak too much to it other, besides that. If you've watched any of like Mark Zuckerberg's trials or, you know, the guy that created Facebook, if you've listened to the questions that Congress and stuff has been asking him or the Senate, like that's, those questions are almost exactly what these other secure solutions are coming up of. of like, do you track people's information? Yes. Oh, we don't track your information. Do you keep track of people's search histories? Yes. Oh, we don't keep track of people's search histories. So it's, it's really a response to uh negative publicity and trying to find an alternative but like i said i don't know i kind of give into that convenience factor of like once you use the internet like you got to figure everything you're doing is leaving a trace um so these last couple i'm pretty sure are just uh again kind of like being as a rewards program if you want to feel good about using them these are ones that say they do stuff for you when you use their search engines i don't know how to verify it or make sure that they do it but give water is a search engine that says they our social impact search engine, which has, wants to have a positive impact on the world by empowering users to solve the issue of poor quality water and ineffective sanitation across the developing world. So um, there's some stuff there, the, who the CEO and the founder is. If you wanna look him up and find out who he is and what he does, you're welcome to dig into it. But I mean, clean water, awesome idea. If using their search engine is actually, to me, I, Colin has a great phrase that if something's for free, you're the product. So to me, this is like, if you're using this, they're making money off of it somehow. And I'm pretty sure it's because they're selling your information and your search engine history to somebody else so that they can make money to buy clean water. I'm not exactly sure that's how it works, but Collins made me paranoid that if something's for free, you're the product. So. Yeah, I think uh, for a lot of these uh, uh, charitable entrepreneurial deals, I think that, uh, in many cases, they they designate in the charter that they'll what they'll do is is set aside a certain percentage of the profits um, to you know one initiative or another. Um, for the lion's share, they are ad delivery systems, and that's how they're making most of their money is by sh serving you banner ads. Um, so. But there probably is metadata involved as well that they're going to share with other companies. I think we skipped one, Colin, or there was just another. It was. I, I, I got a little overzealous, so I went back to this okay, one. I was like, oh, did you skip that one on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe I didn't know something. Um, so this is another one that says they donate their revenue to several partner charities ranging from reforestation and climate action uh, or a different charitable cause every month. So... They use renewable energy sources for their data centers. I haven't seen their data centers. I don't know. Um, taking a stand for civil rights, not storing user or search related data on their servers. So 
if you're looking for good causes that say they um, don't keep your data and don't track it, this would be another one that you could explore. I don't know what the results are like from it. This is another one who says your Google search engines actually contribute to the creation of CO2. So they're just coming after the big guys. So the battle this issue, this company uses revenues generated from the search engine to plant trees. And it takes around 45 searches to plant a new tree. So every time you do 45 searches, you somebody plants a tree somewhere for you, they said. I don't know. But, um, this one's kind of interesting. And I don't know, maybe it's more for guys like Colin and I that have been around the internet for a long time and done DOS searches and networking and message boards. But um, Internet Archive is kind of a way to search old websites. Um, looks at documented material, free videos, books, music, software. Um, you could find about anything that you're looking here for, but it kind of specialized. This to me kind of reminds me of like, instead of going to the library and using a computer to Google something, like if you actually know how to go find microfiche and like look back through articles, that's kind of what Internet Archive reminds me of. But every now and then microfiche is kind of cool. And I don't know, they're using a lot of movies to solve murders and stuff. So it must be good. <laughs> Colin, have you ever used this one? I I have, yeah. Okay. Um, mostly to see if I could find, you know, old websites that I made as a middle schooler and things like that. <laughs> um, and uh, there is, it, it really does reinforce that, you know, everything is permanent on the internet. Um, you can, uh, there, there have been a number of things that have been, uh, taken down but for the most part if it was if it was up and it was up for any substantial period of time there is an archive of it cool I mean, there's a couple things i know my dad used to do web production and he's passed but i know he always wanted to push me he had a family website he was always trying to maintain and manage and tried to hand over the keys but i didn't really get the password and domain and all that stuff before he died and be interesting to see if that kind of thing's still out there that'd be something i'd use that for because i'm sure it's died a long time ago and I'm, that website hasn't been in production for a while, but see who bought the domain or see what's happening with that website now. But so the last part about these search engines, and then we still have like half an hour and I have, I literally regurgitated a Google presentation that we've done a while about using Google for a search engine and some just general search engine tips we'll go through. But this is one of those slides that has some links on it. If you were to revisit this presentation on your own sometime about how most search engines work, what are the seven most popular search engines in the world? And then the 10 best image search engines. If you wanted to look at it, you could find more information on your own. Um, what an interesting rabbit hole it was to find out how much there is about other search engines. Um, but Google is the most popular choice. It may not always be the best choice. Depends on what your needs are. Um, alternative search engines can provide better experience than Google, if you're, especially if it's something specific. Um, whether you're concerned about privacy or just want to explore your options, there's plenty of things that you can try to do it with. And, you know, if it's something where you're on your computer and you're practicing, you know, take a look at some of these. I don't know, maybe you want to see if you plant, if you do 45 searches, you get a notification that, hey, we're planting a tree because you did 45 searches. Or maybe you can look at what their um, production is like for not any, not having CO2 emissions at their data storage site. I don't know. Some of that stuff sounds pretty cool. And I'd like to think that, you know, we could live in a world where everybody's doing that stuff and they could attack the big guy. But um, so take a look. If, is there any questions on this before we go on like tips and tricks to how to use Google? You can comment or you can comment or use the chat feature or if you want to use your mic, you can unmute. Barbara, go ahead. Um, I don't know if this is this is not directly relevant, but I have a question. Uh, I have been planning to buy a new Macintosh desktop mm -hmm. and but last week I read that the new Macs have some vulnerability some cybersecurity vulnerability um, that there's you know there's something in the programming or the code that makes them vulnerable to malware do you know anything about that should I put off buying my new computer until they get it fixed there are uh, a couple of zero day uh, exploits that were previously undiscovered that have been discovered in Big Sur, which is the latest operating system. Um, typically, 
when once we find out about something about like this, the developers have known about it for a few days, um, and they will surely patch uh, the the vulnerability within another week or two. So it's probably safe uh, to buy a new Mac. You're just going to want to make sure you run the updates as soon as possible uh, once you get it online. The other thing to think about is uh, the, and this is kind of getting into the weeds, but um, Apple just created their own uh, processor. Um, they had previously been using Intel processors and there was an exploit that they they found for that too, which they're going to patch. Um, but uh, I've encountered uh, on the one new Mac that I got to play around with that had the, uh, the Apple M1 processor, uh, I encountered a few uh, software compatibility issues. Now, you know, within a year or two, those are probably going to be fixed as well. Um, but there may be an interim period uh, where if you could buy last year's model with the, with the i7 or i5 Intel processor, um, it, it might save you a little bit of a headache for, for the initial six months or so. Fine, thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I think that one's tough because Apple had such a long-standing reputation of being like, you know, immune to viruses and nothing bad ever happens to them. So I think any small crack in the armor and everybody's gonna go after it. But like Colin said, both Microsoft and Apple do a tremendous job of, you know, they got huge teams that are specifically out there to find these flaws and correct them as soon as possible. Anytime there's a big update or an operating system update, somebody's gonna find flaws in it and then come out those, those companies aren't going to try to stay vulnerable for long. It would be incredibly damaging. So whether it's well, Microsoft or Windows. And Apple Apple benefited from what we refer to as security through obscurity for many years, which was that there's there was such a small number. It, it represented a small market share. Um, so most virus writers didn't focus on Apple because if you were trying to make money off of data exploits, it would make a lot more sense to try to target uh, Microsoft. But in the interim, Apple became one of the most profitable com countries in the world. Their marketing was very successful. Um, the, the percentage of the market share and the number of workstations that they deployed increased uh, a lot. And in in that interim period, we've started seeing malware that's written specifically to attack uh, Macs. All right. Any other questions before we move on to how to use Google or search engines in general a little bit better? All right. We only have half an hour, so we'll pound through these kind of quick. Again, I left as much detail on the slides as I could um, just so that you could reference it. So just a little bit of information about Google. So it is, it is a search engine and um, web browser. So Google Chrome is their web browser. And then from there, Google is your search engine. And uh, they try to incorporate and tie all their stuff together. So then from there, you have a whole platform of apps. Um, you've got your Google Docs, your Google Sheets um, to compete with the Microsoft Office package. Um, like I said, it's one of the big three. You got Google, Microsoft, and Apple. Um, Google is also has their own, uh, it, it's not really a computer, but a web-based platform, the Chromebooks um, that is that uses the internet and kind of turns everything, turns your internet interface into a computer, if you will, because um, you can access all the apps and do those things through the internet by using those Google-based programs and browsers. So you can do most things that I would say most people do on a computer between your email and your docs and your internet browsing and stuff. You can do most of the, you can do all those things through a Chromebook. I think a lot of educational platforms are using it. Um, so <clears throat> the search engine has been um, the basis for Google to get started. That was their big thing that they had. And their search engine has a great learning curve. And the more you use it, the more custom it comes to what you want to use, what you want to get out of it, that can be a little scary or it can be a little entertaining for the ride that it's going to push the information to make you do what it thinks you want to do. It knows you better than you know you kind of thing. So depending on where you sit on that development scale, 
That can be either terrifying or it can be like, awesome. I'm glad that Google knows when I'm about to run out of milk and eggs or that I'm looking for tactical sporks or whatever it is that it, Google finds for you and says that you need. Um, you may find that really convenient or you may find that really creepy. So if you want to read more about how Google got started or you want to look at their search tips and tricks, um, there's a link on Digital Trends, which I think is a really cool website. I like to read a lot and I follow them on Twitter and I probably read their stuff on other networks and uh, message boards. So Digital Trends is a cool website that I like to look at. Um, the easiest things to remember when you're doing search engines is keep it simple. Um, I wouldn't say when the internet was new, but as I was a teacher in a previous life and uh, I ran an online charter school and it was always interesting to me that the kids would get so lazy that they would just cut and paste like an entire test question into a search engine bar to try to find an answer for a test or whatever. And it's like, man, if you would just take the pertinent information from that question, you could find the answer that you're looking for right away. But since you copy and pasted the whole question into the Google chat bar, like you're not going to find the answer that you want because it's going to be way too advanced. So, um, you know, instead of typing, what were the economic and uh, cultural effects of the civil war and its aftermath and amendments to the constitution between 1865 and 1869, you know, like instead of just typing in like, you know, repercussions of civil war. They would put in that whole thing and it's like, you have no results because nobody ever typed in that exact question before or they'd get exactly that question and exactly the results and then you know that they're cheating because they would copy and paste the same answer, cut and paste. So try to use some computer logic, take out the extraneous stuff and rephrase it into just what you need for information. So um, Google's really smart. It's pretty cool that you don't need to be a great speller. I know a lot of people that are benefiting from Google because you don't need to be a good speller, which is sometimes a little frustrating as well. Um, you don't want to be too specific unless you're looking for really limited results. Um, things like you can, if you, instead of saying what pizza places are nearby my house at this location, you can simplify that and just say pizza places nearby. And uh, it'll give you, you know, it uses your geographic location based on Google Maps and Google tracking to verify um, a location of places that will deliver pizza to your uh, nearby. We'll give you some more tips on how to keep it simple here on the next slide. Um, descriptive words. <laughs> so um, if you're having trouble finding results, then you get more specific. Um, so it's easier to start with a broad picture and then narrow it down if you're getting too many results. So if the first couple of results that you're looking past the ads aren't giving you the information that you need, maybe you need to change your search results to be a little bit more specific. <clears throat> Not really a good example, like an easy one to give on this, but we talk about some in the other ones where we talk about like, okay, if you're looking for results for your 69 Mustang windows and you just type in Mustang, you probably don't wanna have, you know, Mustang the horses, uh, the latest Shelby GT Mustang, you want to have 1969 Mustang windows. So um, be as specific as you need to, to narrow down the results as you can, but start broad stroke and then fine tune it down. Again, spelling doesn't matter. And um, I won't use his name, but I'm going to throw him under the bus that one of my electricians still can't spell win this day, which I just feel sad where I'm like, that's one of those words. Like I had to work really hard at environment to be able to spell that correctly, but Characteristics still gives me trouble every now and then, but witness day, I feel like we should be able to spell witness day at this point as an, as an adult, but um, you cannot spell witness day correctly and Google will still help you find results. So um, it's gotten a lot smarter over the years. Um, there's some examples here where if you know the song, never gonna give you up, you could type in those letters that's really close, but not anywhere near what the words are. And phonetically, it's going to do a pretty good job of guessing and give you results that are going to say, that's going to be that song, never going to give you up. But if it was intentional, it'll also give you the option to go, I showed you search results for this because I corrected your spelling, but would you like to accurately search for this? Best example I can give you on that one is my last name is Wagner with two A's. If you've noticed it on my uh, Zoom thing there, and it really is spelled with two A's. I guarantee you, even though I've done it a hundred times, if I type in my last name to Google, it's like, here's the first hundred results for Wagner with one A. And it's like, no, 
it, I do intentionally want to search Wagner with two A's. Like, so put that back in there and those are the results I want. So that would be one example, especially if I have a hard to spell last name, it's going to guess like, maybe that's not right. Like everybody else does whenever I spell my last name for them. So um, that's about it for spelling. Again, use important words only. So instead of writing, again, I gave the pizza example earlier, but instead of finding, where can I find a Chinese restaurant that delivers? If you just type in Chinese restaurants nearby or Chinese delivery, Google will do a lot of the rest of that for you and give you places nearby you using your Google results and your GPS location um, to give you those results. Um, use words that websites use. If you've spent any time using the internet, <clears throat> you are getting more familiar with the technical jargon, um, specific words. So instead of, again, I get, the example I gave for the kids copying a test question, that's kind of what you want to avoid is just pick the logic. I, I won't pronounce it right and Colin will probably correct me, but I think it's Boolean logic or at least that's how it's spelled. Yeah, Boolean. Boolean. Um, and so it's just that make it short and simple and cut it down to just what you need. So um, websites don't say things that people do. They try to use the language that sounds professional. So instead of saying I have a flat tire, you don't want results for you have a flat tire. You want results for how do I repair a flat tire? Instead of saying my head hurts, you, want res you don't want to let everybody know on the internet your head hurts. You want to know how do you get relief from a headache? Um, so think, you know, I have to have this discussion with like my younger kids all the time of like, oh yeah, that's your problem. I'm glad you've shared your problem. We can be part of the problem or we can be part of the solution. What's the solution? What are you looking for? What do you really want to happen? You know, your brother hit you. I get it. It happens. What would you like to have happen to your brother now that he's hit you? So um, try to think of those kind of things when you're doing search results. Um, again, gradually adding terms, start broad stroke or 10,000 foot view and narrow down as you go. Um, job interviews would be a great way if you're looking for a new job. How to, and then you can talk about how to prepare for job interviews, how to prepare for a job interview in technology, how to apply for a job at Mankato Computer Technology because I love technology and I'm ready to be a tech and I want to work with Colin. Um, the reason that you don't go straight to the first try is because you want, you may find stuff in between. So if you look at the broad stroke first, then narrow down and get as specific as you can. <clears throat> um, Google search can be flexible. So it knows what you want. Um, even if you're using just a single word or phrase, so you can use multiple terms to do that. Um, it can help you narrow down our syntax. So best ways to prepare for a job interview or how to prepare for a job interview. Those are going to give you similar results. Um, but searching both phrases, you might find a little different results. So if you don't find exactly what you're looking for, rephrase the question and see if that helps you find answers like chocolate or white chocolate. They're going to give you different results. Both of them are going to contain white chocolate. Which information are you looking for? How many websites do you want to spend on there? So um, if you want the widest search, you can search for both. Um, the tabs on the top. So we talked about um, at the beginning of the class, we talked about specific search engines that search specific things. The cool thing about Google and other websites or search engines like Bing is they're going to give you the option to, I want to search for videos. I want to search for news. I want to search for images. Um, and some of them even have, you can search an image. So you can take a picture of an image, put it in the search. You can search for images and then put that image into the search bar and it'll look for other images like that on the internet or whether it explains what it is to you, etc. I read an interesting Quora article today about people that find items in their house and don't know what they are. And I didn't get enough time to dive into it because I really wanted to see what this one thing was. I was like, I don't know what that is, but if I had one in my house, I think I'd be freaked out. So um, you can look for things like that. Um, Bing and Google both have it. So if you're not using something where you're specifically looking for copyrighted content or uncopyrighted content or message board content, um, these search engines can be really helpful. And you can do one search, you can just do a regular search. And then you're like, well, I just really want pictures of that. And you can just click on the image tab and then it'll just give you the results of the same search, but with just images. Just be careful that if you change your search after you've clicked on a tab, 
it'll keep you in that tab most times. So depending on the settings of your computer, but so if you search for, I'm just going to use the Mustang again, you search for 69 Mustang and they're like, I want to see pictures of a 69 Mustang. And then you switch to like, well, I want to read an article about the oil filter that they use in the 69 Mustang. And you type 69 Mustang oil filter, it's got, you're going to be in images and then you're just going to get pictures of the oil filter for the 69 Mustang. So then if you want the information about it, you're probably going to have to go back to the first tab that you were using. So um, that's how to use the image tab. Same thing happens with news. If you're looking for current news articles. Um, so be specific. If you're not finding exactly what you're looking for, before you switch search engines, you might want to look at the tabs across the top and go, well, what am I looking for? Am I looking for an article? Am I looking for an image? Am I looking for a video? Um, what am I looking for? So use those tabs and you'll get really far. You'll have a lot of success. Um, so this was the photo one that I was talking about. You can save an image and then use it to search that image on the internet. It'll match it with the camera. Uh, you press on the camera button, you paste the image from where you have it saved at, and it will search that image and find results from around the web. Kind of a cool feature, um, especially like in my industry, you get breakers or weird parts and you're like, I don't even know what kind of wire this is. And you can maybe take a picture of it and get results. So kind of a neat thing if you're good at copy pasting pictures or have a ton of pictures of weird things that you want to find out what they are. Hey, Trevor. Yeah. Back to that previous slide, how do you, I mean, if you take a picture, I'm assuming you like with the camera and your laptop. Yep. How do you put that into the web then? Oop, Colin, you're already demoing. We're such a good team. <laughs> if you uh, open up Google, and click on images, it's going to take you to a slightly different uh, 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 interface here. And you can do click this camera button and hit search by image. Okay. Um, and it'll give you an option to either paste it, uh, an internet address or upload an image. If you click upload an image, then you just need to find the file location on your computer. I don't know if I have any pictures. Yes, on. Do a picture oh, yeah. You. Let's see what happens. Here's myself. <laughs> we'll upload the file. How good is Google? Ooh, look at all these fun Colin Chambers. Bunch of guys wearing my pants. <laughs> um, Ooh, look, and, it did come up. It's you. Yep, Mankato Computer Technology. Ooh, scary Google knows where you are. Knows who yep. you are by just your picture. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a little, it's a little creepy. Yeah. <laughs> you and Jerry do a hunger or whatever that guy's name are. <laughs> Doing hunger. Does he work there too, or is that somebody that works for you guys? Yeah, he's a oh, okay. he's right text. All right. I was like, wow, that they matched you to some random guy. <laughs> <laughs> Got a doppelganger out there. So yeah, great question, Tom. And Colin, thanks. That was way easier than trying to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Let's see. How do I? Oh, yeah. Here we go. All right. Next one after this, Colin. So um, punctuation is a little bit tricky with Google because the punctuation actually has commands that are associated with it in some instances. So depending on how you use your spaces, your asterisks, your quotes, or periods or exclamation parts, they all have a little bit of a different function um, in Google and it'll try to match them based on the ones that you use. Um, so just be careful when you're using punctuation sense. We'll give you some examples here on the next slide. Um, so if you use quotes, that's if you're trying to match an exact phrase to find on the internet. So just like I said, with the spelling, um, or if you're looking for a very specific thing, um, usually names, or if it's a saying or something you want to do using quotes in it, will try to find an exact match rather than these are things that seem similarly to what you searched for. So if you're using the quotes, it'll give you exactly what you're looking for with results. Again, that's more of a, once you're getting into your fine brush strokes, instead of like the broad strokes, when you're really narrowing down, like I want to get something really pinpoint specific. I wouldn't suggest starting with quotes, but Song lyrics. If, song lyrics. If you're looking for song lyrics, it's it's a, a good thing to good. use. Good. Um, so more things to use quotes. Just keep your search parameters in there. The hyphen. I have two slides here, and I didn't realize that I did this, but this one says hyphen, and the other one says the minus sign. So depending on which one is more appealing to you, which one you like to call it. Um, the hyphen 
Um, you may find yourself looking for a term uh, with an ambiguous. So this one, this is where I come up with a Mustang example because this is the one, the one I wrote. So you can find ones that are either a, made by Ford or you find a horse. So if you want to find the ones that are horses, you can do Mustang and then a hyphen or minus symbol and then cars. And then that'll give you results without the cars. You're subtracting the cars. So um, that's a kind of a cool way to do it. Uh, you could minus automobile. That would be another way to do it or car. So um so this was the one where I was like, oh, I did hyphen and minus sign. I did two different slides. I said the exact same thing. Um, the other one's colon to search specific sites. This one, I don't know anybody that's this good on their search engines because Google does it pretty automatically for you. But if you really wanted to pin down your search and you wanted to look for um, specific sites, um, this would be a way that you like, I know that every day I go and I, I use the hockey one because I'm a hockey guy. So if I wanted to look at articles about Sidney Crosby, instead of searching the whole internet for Sidney Crosby, I just wanted to search the articles on NHL.com, then I could search Cindy Crosby and then write the word site colon NHL.com. And it's only gonna give me results for Sidney Crosby that occurred on the NHL.com website. So it's gonna really narrow down my site. But if you know, I'm looking for something specific that was only mentioned on this website, I think the next example I give is like time.com, time magazine. Maybe there was something, an article that you read in a time magazine um, or on a, any website, it doesn't necessarily need to be a magazine, whatever, then you can use that colon search engine. Um, so think of the site as a, you know, think of the site as the quotes. Um, it's only a search of a particular website. So if you wanted to look at articles about Google that appeared in time magazine, that's how you would search it is by typing, ignore the quotes for this example, but you would type Google site colon time.com and then you would get only articles in time.com that mentioned Google magazine. I don't know anybody that searches that way, but it's something you can do a tool that you can use. Um, New York Times would be another one. Uh, if, you want some, if you wanted to read about articles that linked to the New York Times or that posted something that would link to the New York Times, um, instead of typing site, you would type link, and then it's going to give you all the pages that link to the New York Times official website. So again, I'm not exactly sure what you would use this feature for, but it's a feature that's built in there. So um, you could, uh, the more specific you get, the fewer results that you're going to get. So if you wanted, for some reason, if you wanted to search something, a topic, and you, I want to read about Second Amendment rights that all have links to the New York Times, or I want to read about the GameStop stock that only links to articles in the Wall Street Journal, then you could do those kind of things. <clears throat> yeah, I, th I think of a lot of these as memory tools. Um, so like when you, when you remember that, oh, I saw this article three months ago, three years ago, three days ago, I know it was in this periodical. Um, but you know, I can't remember. I can't exactly pull it up. These are these are good things to use for that. Although in a lot of cases, you don't even need uh, the colon anymore because the algorithms right. have gotten pretty good. Um, so I like how Colin relates all of his search stuff to like things he thinks about in the shower because that seemed like a big shower thought to me. Like, oh, I'm in oh, the you shower. Have no idea I'm about that article I read. <laughs> three months ago in time magazine <laughs> those are the things that'll torture you trevor <laughs> you should see i have a sticky note collection next to my bed and a whole box of pens because if i wake up in the middle i'll wake up in the middle of the night with anxiety of like i forgot about this i gotta write this down because i gotta do this tomorrow so like i literally have uh, sticky notes and pens all over my nightstand because i just have to wake up in the middle of the night and write stuff down because i forget about it i have bad dreams about things i have to do at work the next day <laughs> Um, asterisk is a wild card. It's kind of fun. Um, it will leave a placeholder that may automatically be filled by the search engine later. Again, this is a song lyrics example. So Colin used it earlier that like, okay, I know there's this song and it goes come, but I can't remember what the next word is. And it's like right now. And then I can't remember what the next word is, but it ends in me. So what are, what are those words? So it'll hold a placeholder in there for you. And it may look like nonsense, but then Google can give you the results that say that's from the famous Beatles song that says come together right now over me. And uh, so those asterisks will give you a space holder if you know like a phrase and you're like, 
I don't know. The song always goes da 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 da, and then it ends like this. So those asterisks will hold a placeholder for you. Um, this is just another one. It's another example of a different song. Um, sites that are similar to other sites. So um, now that Amazon owns the world, uh, it'd probably be hard to find a site related to Amazon.com. But say you had a website that you really like to use, but it's not available anymore, or you don't like using it anymore because you had bad customer service there, you could say, find me a website that is related to amazon.com. And it'll give you a list of websites that offer similar products and services as amazon.com. So maybe uh, like I'm thinking there was a tire store in town, r and Tire, and they're not here anymore. So like, uh, I don't know how good their website was, but I'm trying to just give an example of like, give me websites that are related to r and Tire, or maybe it's related to Discount Tire. Like I want to buy from a store like Discount Tire, but I don't want to buy from Discount Tire anymore. So what are the websites that are really similar to Discount Tire? Um, so I think of it with stores or websites that you may not want to do business with. Of like, what's another place that offers that service? This might be a way to search for those. Barnes and Noble, Best Buy, those are things that you could think of for that. Um, as my kids have found out with distance learning, Google's really good at doing your homework for you. <laughs> so Alexa will do it, Siri will do it, and all you have to do is ask them. Um, and you can literally just use your voice. You don't even have to type in the numbers anymore. So they'll just tell you what the answers are. They don't ask if your parents are watching or anything. So um, they can do everything from basic math to Planck's constant. And I'll be honest, my daughter's in seventh grade math, and there's already things that I'm like, I don't know how to do that stuff anymore. And I end up having to Google, like, how do you find the answer in a balancing and algebraic equation or whatever the term is that she's using now? I'm like, I don't know. I got to go back and learn how to do that. But I'll Google it to try to figure out how to do it. Meanwhile, she's just Googling what the answer is and writing it down. And I'm like, yeah, you're going to get in trouble later. Trust me. I tried that with algebra. It doesn't work. <laughs> I did that with algebra before the internet. So, um, but it does work pretty good with quick math if you need to know percentages and stuff. Um, if you've never worked in a salesman where you work on commission, you probably don't know how to do percentages really fast. But if you did ever work as a salesman and work on commission, then you probably know all your percentages really well. But easy way to do math. <laughs> Con conversions too between. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's cups, uh, cups yeah. ounces, cooking stuff. If tablespoons, ounces, grams, milligrams, all that stuff, uh, miles to kilometers. That's really good at all that stuff. Uh, we use all our, for some reason, all our thermometers in our house are Celsius. And there was a while there that I memorized the math formula for how to convert Celsius to Fahrenheit, because honestly, my car thermometer was stuck on Celsius and I wanted to know what temperature it was. So I figured out what the math was so I could do that in my head all the time when I wanted to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit. I don't remember what the formula is anymore. It's not very hard if I remember right. Something plus or minus 32, um, like times five and minus 32, something like that. But um yeah, so all our thermometers, so when our kids get sick, because kids get sick, um, we always have to just ask Google or Siri, like, hey, what is 101 degrees or 32 degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit or 26.2 degrees Celsius in Fahrenheit? And it gives you the translations really good, which is nice. Um, <clears throat> range of numbers. <clears throat> this one's another, like, call and shower thought of if you remember that, like, who played at Lollapalooza in 1995? You can search Lollapalooza dot, 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 uh, 95, and it'll give you just the results for um, who was at that band, who was at that concert related to those years. So whether you do a series of numbers or et cetera. So the dots can represent a number if you want to search something specific that happened in a time frame. Trevor, we just got a few minutes left. Do we yeah. want to? We've got more than a few slides oh, left. Yeah. Do we want to just ask for questions and uh, absolutely Thanks call for it a night? Colin. Like I said, this one's a ton of information, and I want to give you as much. And a lot of these are, again, these are how to get to those fine strokes. So print them off, look at them. There's links. Um, I think there's a summary at the end of just fun stuff you can do or tips and tricks. But start with broad strokes, go to fine strokes, and uh, Feel free to ask Colin or I any questions while you have us here for a couple minutes and we'll be back next month. I know Mike just sent me the topic earlier today, I think. Yeah, I think that one is on computing basics, isn't it?
Yeah, something like uh, computers in everyday life or something like that. Uh, get up to speed with computer basics. Yep. So any uh, any questions doesn't have to be related to Google while well, you got us here. Thank you. Okay. Very interesting. I learned a lot. Great. If no one else has, I got a couple of them. <laughs> I'm sure everybody's just chuckling away there. What about doing something on the VPN? I think that's, I think you've asked for that before. And <laughs> I think uh, the fact that we're talking about how to use Google and do computer basics, I don't know how many people would have much use for a virtual private network, but. Well, there's, there's, uh, it's gotten a lot easier. Um, the, the one that I have set up for the most people is called Nord VPN. Um, and it's like $80 a year. Uh, you, you can get it on up to five devices. Um, the nice thing about a VPN is that, um, you don't have to worry about doing secure stuff when you're on you know, like uh, in a hotel or at a coffee shop, you can still, it, if you're going through your VPN, you can check your bank account, uh, you can check your credit card, that that kind of good stuff. If you're trying to watch, uh, you know, movies through a BBC streaming site, you can make your computer think that it's in London. Um, so there, there are, uh, there are good uses for it. Nord uh, seems to be um, sort of the front runner right now. I'm not sure how affordable it is versus the others, but um, there are some free ones. Uh, in my experience, the free ones are not as user friendly. Okay. Um, now the question is, can I, is it possible to, on my laptop to hook up a TV screen so I can use it as a second screen? Yeah. If you have uh, an HDMI port um, on the computer, um, then if it's a if it's a television that was manufactured in the last five to ten years, yep. um, most flat screen TVs have an HDMI port on the back. So what you do is just run the HDMI cord from the side of the computer to uh, uh, to the back of the TV. And then um, on, if it doesn't show up automatically, um, you just right click on your uh, desktop, um, go to display settings, and it's gonna show you uh, displays that are open. You can tell it to detect it if it's not, if it's not showing up and, and hopefully you should be able to um, select, move them around if you wanna change which one's on the left and on the right. Um, but that's the way to do that. Some wireless options would be like Chromecast or Microsoft had a stick that you can plug in. I think yeah, if there's the smart TVs can detect uh, another source. Yep. If the yeah, Roku is good at, at streaming. That's all stuff that's that's pretty recent. Um, some of the some of the newer Samsung TVs will you'll be able to cast directly to it without any cords or adapters. You know, we're not that tech, uh, that great technology <laughs> for the big TV. We do for the little ones, but that's kind of pointless. My yeah, I mean the the cords are cords are nice because they're they're simple and uh, you know it's usually pretty painless to just plug them in and you know you've got everything where it's supposed to be. Okay, one question was is that we have our tablet and we are using like presentations from Vine. And I can um, cast that to the big TV, the video, but I can't do the sound. The sound just stays at the tablet. Is there a way of casting that to the big TV also? Um, that could. I'm, I mean, I'm not positive what uh, what exactly is transpiring there, but um, sometimes if you Go. Audio settings. Is that where you look for Colin? Uh, yeah. Sometimes if you have multiple things, I'm gonna change screens here. Let me. Okay. 
And do you say that's with a hard wire or are you streaming that, Tom? Like, streaming are you, that. Okay, so are you using a Chromecast or what are you using? Yes, Chromecast. Okay, some of the first, and, and I'll tell you from experience, some of the first and second gen Chromecast will not transmit an audio signal based on um, how much bandwidth you have in your house. So <laughs> depending on the audio compression of the file that you're trying to stream, some of the Chromecasts won't stream a digital audio stream. So depending on what the compression rate is and the bandwidth is in your house, it's not all Chromecasts are capable of uh, streaming audio across the bandwidth in your house. Great. Yeah, that could definitely be the case. Um, but that was so earlier generations. I think they fixed it by the later generations. But if you have, like I have one of the first gen ones that's a stick with a big bulb on the back. Yeah. And I, I've had problems with my bandwidth and my audio before with that one. If you also right click on your uh, your audio icon down in the lower right hand corner, um, if you have multiple applications going, sometimes it'll draw sound. And I've seen it at times where Chrome will be muted for unknown reasons uh, while the other system sounds are up. So I would just check that to make sure that that you don't need to just adjust the sound for Chrome. Yeah, because it can also be a setting on if you want to push your audio through the Chromecast or if you want to push your audio through the device that you're casting it from. Yeah, and the way you determine that is by left clicking on on your audio icon down there, and it's going to show you which device you're you're on, whether it's the internal speakers. If you click up, it'll show you any other speakers that are present or any other audio devices. So that's the first thing to check, and if it's on Chromecast and you're not getting audio then it might be a bandwidth issue based on the generation or the compression rate of the audio that you're listening to. Yeah, unfortunately, that's it's a pretty, that's a, something with a lot of variables. So, um, but those are the things I'd try. Okay. Anybody else? All right, well, I have to feed my son dinner. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. It's good to see you all. Good to see you, Barb and Ted. Yeah, thank you. How old is Keegan now? Oh, 16. he's so old. <laughs> 17. Yeah. 17? He's 17. Yep. Oh. How That's many... how I feel about it, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it didn't bother me to turn 50 or 60, although 70 gave me pause. It was when my children turned 30 and then 40 and now 50 that that are the shocker birthdays for me i'm still 30 it's okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'll take that yeah nice to talk to you colin thank you trevor yeah absolutely thanks, colin. Right. thanks everybody thank you